I'm actually going to talk about some different lenses that we can look at in terms of policy development and policy thinking. Uh, Peter's brought up a number of challenges we have in the area of investment and in infrastructure in particular. Uh, but I'm actually going to look at things through a slightly different lens and say, what do we need to do to change our thinking in policy development to really be able to get better outcomes? First of all, though, I want to actually get us thinking about what is rural investment. And generally, we tend to think about rural investment as being hard infrastructure, land, roads, bridges, telecommunications. But I actually want us to not think about just hard infrastructure but soft infrastructure, social infrastructure, and that's about our people. That's about things such as education, health, aged care, childcare, so those sort of human services. Because in the end, there is no point in investing in hard infrastructure if you're not at the same time investing in our people. And I'll give you a classic example that goes back a few years, but you may recall there was a lot of money put into um, building schools, uh, particularly in remote places. Um, building roads in some of those remote places. That was all very well, but unless you were going to actually invest in some of those communities to have the people there, those schools were going to be empty and those roads were not going to be used. So it's really important to, to look at that, and that's the lens through which I'll be looking at this. In fact, uh, in Europe, they've, they've tried to, uh, to define hard and soft infrastructure, and I think the important thing there is it picks up on Peter's point, which is about being able to invest in the long term but the very important thing there is if you look at the fact that they say you must combine hard and soft to be able to deliver more sustainability, resilience to climate change, picking up once again on what Peter said, new transport energy modes for an ageing society, and we know that's what we have, but at a socially acceptable cost. And that's a real policy change, challenge for governments, but also it's a policy challenge for the community because we've actually got to think what is that socially acceptable cost when we think about investment. So what I'm going to look at are four issues in relation to policy responses to the challenges of rural investment, the political imperative that I think a lot of us would be well aware of. I'm going to talk about stewardship and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on stewardship, um, outcomes and diversity because I think they're the four areas we really do need to, to change our thinking. First of all, the political imperative. This is a reality. And there's a nice um, quote there from Doug Bando which says, legislators consistently put the political imperative before the national interest. Unfortunately, and, and once again, Peter talked about picking winners, uh, we have governments that too often pick winners. Why? Because it makes a very nice announceable. And we get you know, a particular constituency that think it's a great thing, but is it actually better for the broader community? And I'll come back to picking winners when, when I talk about outcomes. And then overlaying that in terms of political, political imperative, we also have the fact that we have a federated system. So we may get a national approach that is delivered through the states and we get the states deciding they will do something different, which once again is a challenge and it's a challenge for businesses, particularly where they operate nationally or they, they operate in, in uh, cross-border locations um, and that's something that unfortunately for us, is a reality. Let me move on to stewardship, because stewardship is an interesting concept. It's actually not a new concept, but it's something that governments are having to grapple with, and it's something that I see as being the real game changer in terms of our policy thinking. And this is really starting to drill down on what do we mean by government as an enabler. And we hear a lot that government should create the right environment and then get out of the way, but what does that mean? It does require that long-term thinking, so it's not just over a political cycle, but it really is about government owning the system. And it requires a different type of relationship between government and business. So what we need government to do is to actually set the right environment, but then not step away. Government needs to look after the system. It needs to treat the system as an asset, as an investment. It needs to continue to maintain and look after that asset but it needs to allow the business and the community to actually be able to work within that system and be able to get on and deliver how they see. Part of that means that business itself actually needs to take ownership and be part of the solution. It can't be that business says, this is government's problem, you need to solve it. Business has to be part of that solution to make this work. The other area that we, um, we see real challenges in, in policy development, is being able to focus on outcomes. 
And I'll come back to that picking winners. Because too often, we start with the solution and not the problem. So what happens is you'll get a minister that'll actually say, I want to do something. I want to regulate this. I've recently been looking at uh, the New South Wales regulatory framework and you know, greyhounds, lockout laws. You know, that was the answer before actually saying, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Now, anyone who's been involved with good policy development knows that you always start with what's the problem. Unfortunately, good policy making doesn't follow that process most of the time. We need to get back to starting with the problem. Quite often, if you actually start with thinking what that problem is, you won't end up getting the solution you thought may be the case. And we need to go through proper evaluation of costs and benefits. Once again, when we see policy put up to government to make a decision, uh, they articulate the benefits quite well, they don't come up with the costs. Unless you actually know the costs, uh, you may actually come up with a different option. We also need governments to change their thinking towards risk appetite, and that goes back to stewardship. For government to be able to take a true stewardship approach and be able to step back, they've got to understand that there are risks that need to be taken. How do you learn if you don't make mistakes? It becomes more challenging in the area of human services because, of course, if something goes wrong, it may mean a death. But there shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction to that and say, we can't do this. There's got to be an approach that says, we can do this because it's going to be, we're going to get better outcomes if we try it rather than say, no, we're not going there. Co-design is another area that is something we're going to have to work towards in terms of policy design. Co-design is about saying, what is the outcome we want to achieve? And it's going to affect stakeholders. It's going to affect users. It's going to affect consumers. It's going to affect customers. And how do policymakers really know the impact on those end users if they don't involve those end users at the early part of policy development? Now, we hear it framed in terms of consultation, but it has to go beyond that. It has to be more involving those users with how that design might look like. And some of the terms that we see, uh, we've heard about trials and pilots, we now call them sandboxes. Get in the sandbox with a whole lot of different people and let's play and let's see what we can come up with. And then, of course, there's collaboration and working together at all different levels, whether that's different levels of government or whether it's with government, business and the community is what we need to do to get better outcomes. And then the other area is diversity. And I think one of the things we need to think about in terms of diversity is one size doesn't fit all. And that for rural and regional Australia is so true. We can look at the cities and we can say there, there are a lot of similarities in, the ter in terms of how you put policy in place. You cannot do that for rural and regional Australia. We have different forms that operate in, in uh, regional Australia. Cooperatives, for example, are something that in the ag sector are quite common in terms of collaboration, bringing people together to get common outcomes. Different thinking. We actually need to think about capacity and capability building, and this, of course, goes back to the social infrastructure I was talking about at the start, and different environments. You know, climate variability, once again, picking up on what Peter said, and security of tenure, which I think I'll leave Eddie to talk about. Some of the examples we see um, are around Northern Australia. So on the one hand, you can take Northern Australia as being picking winners. On the other hand, you can say, this is a way of sandboxing. This is a way of actually saying, what can we pilot across different areas in Northern Australia with different opportunities and different projects, and how can they be translated to other areas in the country? We have hubs. We have regional hubs that are being developed through collaborative opportunities and they are great ways of bringing people together. We know that in this country we have a real challenge around connectivity with uh, telecommunications. Some communities actually get together and invest in their own Wi-Fi tower. So thinking about how they can be connected and how they can focus on what they need and not just waiting for government to come in and provide a solution for them are some of the ways we need to think and how we can enable people to do that. In the area of human services, of course, education and health, we see some really fantastic initiatives happening at the local level. And one of our challenges is to think about how we can upscale some of those great initiatives. One of those areas that we do need to focus on is developing local leadership. At the local level, there, are, there, there is some terrific leadership opportunities for people, but we're not actually leveraging them. We're not actually allowing those to lead 
from that local level and be able to deliver, we're actually saying there needs to be a centralised approach and we need to change our way of thinking there. So what does success look like? Well, you know, I don't need to tell you there's no silver bullet. Um, the aspiration should be a framework where government, business and communities can work together towards common outcomes. That's the thing we really need to think about. Uh, then we will get really a cohesive and what we call a connected community. Thank you.